This is Epicenter, episode 343 with guest Gabriel Jimenez. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. Today, our guest is Gabriel Jimenez. Gabriel is the creator of the Petro, the Venezuelan cryptocurrency. So the Petro was created in late 2017, early 18, right around the ICO boom, and was a highly politicized Venezuelan project to create a cryptocurrency that would be backed by oil prices or oil reserves in Venezuela. And Gabriel was approached by the Venezuelan government to create this cryptocurrency. And he saw within that an opportunity to change his government, to change his country from within. Of course, it didn't quite play out that way because in the end, the government clamped down on the project or at least clamped down on him and took the project in their own hands and took it in their own direction. But throughout all this, Gabriel remained motivated and wanting to bring change to his country went until the very end and almost risked his life to uh, bring this project to fruition. He is now living in the U.S. where he was able to seek asylum and is working on other cryptocurrency projects with a goal to help the people of his country. This episode is a little long. It goes for about an hour and a half. In the beginning, we spent a lot of time talking about the history of Venezuela and the political situations that uh, led him to the point of creating a cryptocurrency for his country. And towards the end, we went into the sort of final moments when he has got to kind of sign the contract and sign everything over to the Venezuelan government and is held at gunpoint by military police. But I'm not going to spoil it, so I'll leave it there. After the interview, Sonny and I talked for an extra 20 minutes to share our own thoughts about the interview and discuss what's happening in Venezuela now, since the country is not in very good shape with oil prices being so low. And we also spent quite a bit of time discussing the situation in the U.S. right now, uh, which by all accounts is not very good. Uh, If you want to hear that conversation, you can do so by signing up to Epicenter Premium. Epicenter Premium gives you a number of benefits. One, you get to hear these debriefs after the interview. You'll also get access to some host roundtables that we'll release once in a while whenever there's something important that we think we should share with you and talk about. Uh, You'll also get access to some bonus content that we release from time to time when we go to conferences or when we record episodes about Uh, project updates and things like that. So if you want to sign up for Epicenter Premium and support the show and get to hear all this great content, you can do so at premium.epicenter.tv. And now here's our interview with Gabriel Jimenez. So we're here today with uh, Gabriel Jimenez, and he is the creator of Petro, but, you know, not actively working on the project anymore, which we'll get into in today's episode. And so I first first met Gabriel a couple months ago. I hosted this event in San Francisco called Macro WTF, and we released a couple of the panels from that event as past episodes. But Gabriel came and talked at that event, and he had this like really amazing story, and I knew we just had to have him on Epicenter soon. But we had to wait a little bit because there was a uh, media block because of, you know, there's an article that came out in the New York Times, and so we needed to wait for that to come out. But that article just came out a couple of weeks ago. You should definitely go check it out. But now that that's out, we're glad to have Gabriel on the show. So, Gabriel, thanks for coming on. Thank you, and thank you for waiting, and thank you for the invitation to the event. Like I was mentioning you before, that changed my life uh, a lot. I was completely destroyed and depressed over there in Chicago, waiting for my paperwork for to be able to work. And right that day, the day before coming here, is when I got my paperwork, and well, the the table was set, and was able to stay here in on the bay and started working on the things that I, that I'm passionate about. So you're living in the Bay Area now? Yes, in Oakland. I was also at a blockchain week. I, I think I missed your talk, but I was staying in Oakland and it was like a really neat kind of place. I think I heard on the, the Charlie Sharm podcast that you're working with Reserve now? I'm supporting Reserve, yeah. Um, 
as you know, they are focusing on hyperinflationary countries, uh, Venezuela, one of them. The reasons that I was working and creating uh, projects in Venezuela related to tech and related in particular to cryptocurrencies is because of the potential that, as we, we know, cryptocurrencies had in, in Venezuela. And I think that very much Reserve has taken the risk to actually try to develop and, and focus on developing tools, uh, particularly for the Venezuelan context, uh, being a Bay Area company that they don't even have a Venezuelan on, on, on their team, but they were focusing on the big problems that Venezuela had. So I decided to support them basically because has been what I, I was working on and the potential of a product like theirs uh, had with the Venezuelan people. But I'm mostly focused right now on creating a project on my own that is a, a marketplace that is focused on providing jobs to Venezuelans. It goes beyond of, of what financial freedom that cryptocurrencies allows you uh, to. I'm, I'm trying to provide dignified jobs. Uh, well, create a tool that is able to match dignified jobs for the Venezuelan people so they don't have to be dependent of either the government or anyone that is subsidizing uh, something in particular, but that they can get a living on, on their own. So using the same fundamentals on technology and crypto payments in order for them to receive their, the value of their work, but also, you know, with their own work, being able to afford their rent, being able to afford their food, their medicine, that is something that is, is lacking on the Venezuelan economy nowadays. So could we backtrack into how you got involved with all of this? And like, you grew up in Venezuela, but you actually were, from what I read, you were living in the US, and then you decided to move back to Venezuela in 2015, I think. Can you talk us a little bit about what inspired you to go back there and like try to start solving these sort of problems? My college years back there in Venezuela, I always was very active politically. Uh, was part of, of a generation over there in Venezuela that is the 2007 generation, and we had many troubles and protests against the Chavez. Back at the time, I created a foundation trying to help unite the people to create common projects, create projects that helps everyone. That's when I was in college. So my plan was to go to the U.S., study, prepare, and go back to Venezuela because what I wanted to dedicate my life was to actually find solutions that uh, affects our life, as you know, the whole crisis that, that is uh, over there in my country. When I went over here to the U.S., uh, that I landed in Boston, I was studying uh, over there at Harvard, some specialization in negotiation and financial accounting and statistics. My plan was to go back. I didn't know when, but I knew that I was here in the U.S. to prepare myself, to learn, to work, and then to go back. That's the reason why I'm here in the U.S. I started working after my, my specialization. I started working at the U.S. Congress. Actually, while I'm in the U.S. Congress, I'm working for a congresswoman, Liana, that is the biggest district. I mean, it's the district that has the most Venezuelans in the U.S., so that's the reason that I decided to work with her with her back in 2014. I actually promoted uh, within her office the first sanctions to the Venezuelan officials uh, that were violating human rights that particular year. The government killed over 100 people, that, uh, particularly young Venezuelans that were protesting once again in 2014. And... In 2015, happened something unique on the Venezuelan modern history that for the first time since Chavez got power in 1998, the opposition won an election for a public office or for a major power that in this case is the legislature. So uh, it's the equivalent to U.S. Congress. For us, it's the National Assembly. I actually was renewing my visa in Mexico back at the time. But when I saw that the opposition won, I thought, as you know, many Venezuelans, a new hope was over there for change. For the first time, the Congress had a lot of power. For, but besides the power that Congress held, it was the Venezuelan people that wanted something different. I didn't know how the political conflict would end up uh, happening. 
But the matter of fact that the Venezuelan people wanted change, it was a clear sign for me that it was a moment to go and support in that movement of change. I didn't have any plan. I actually went back to Miami, sold everything that I had. Uh, I was married at the time. My wife uh, supported me because since the beginning, I told her that was the plan. And, you know, we, as crazy people, we sold everything we had in Miami and closed my office over there and went back to Venezuela without even a plan. I just knew that I wanted to promote to change that uh, was incubating in, on the Venezuelan society. What I realized is that many of my friends from my generation of 2007, they were purely into politics. And there were many brilliant people uh, into politics and fighting from the, for public offices and for all the, um, the political battles that are needed, and particularly in a, such a complex and corrupt country as, uh, as ours. But what I learned here in the U.S. was that big countries are made by big societies by strong entrepreneurs, by innovators that are able, you know, to escape that political conflict and to actually build and challenge what is actually thought as, uh, as only possible. So I thought, hey, with everything that I have learned and with so many people already fighting on, on, on the political side, I had already a digital marketing company and I thought that I could turn it into a tech incubator and actually from incubating new projects and tech projects, I could actually bring solutions to the Venezuelan society and of course act as a company, but building solutions for the Venezuelan society. So that was my thought and that was the reason that I went back. What was it like growing up in Venezuela, you know, pre-Chavez, before he came into power in the 90s? Like, give us a sense of what kind of change the country went through in, you know, 20 years or something like that. When Chavez came to power, I was eight years old. So the majority of my experience from before Chavez got to power is, you know, for investigation and for my early memories that I was just, just a little child. However, the 90s, and the late 80s were a moment of demise on economic crisis in Venezuela. Tons of corruptions already happening in the country and a lot of division and a sentiment of anti-establishment was within our society. Actually, Chavez tried to make a coup on the early 90s. And he becomes widely popular for trying to make a coup to a democratic elected president, which is crazy that people is supporting, you know, a military coup that is going against the constitution. But the people was tired of their politicians, was tired of the corruption and was tired of the whole economy was being handled. So after Chavez is released and Chavez is actually released because then the very next president after the one that Chavez tried to do the coup released him because he was so popular and he wanted to gain like public uh, favor, release him. And Chavez was this anti-establishment figure. He wasn't from the two traditional political parties in Venezuela that they were Ade and Cope. It's very much here in the US, the Democrats and Republicans. So he was a complete outsider claiming to the Venezuelan society to reform the state, to eliminate and crush corruption, that a new system is needed that is by the people and for the people. And if you hear his speeches back in 1996, 1997, 1998, the Chavez that you see, it's basically comparable to the speeches of, of Obama. I'm not lying on this. So if you hear his speeches and, and you say, well, that's the reason, you know, many people liked him. You know, he was a, a very charismatic person. And what he was saying was directly connected to the hearts of the people. And because of the sentiment that the Venezuelan society had, they overlooked the authoritarian characteristics that he had. Because a few years before, he tried to make a coup. So he was no saint on that end. But... Chavez was a, a widely popular figure. Venezuela was in the midst of, of the biggest crisis to back at the time. Uh, also because of the oil barrel, the price of the oil barrel was declining. When Chavez got to power, it's not connected, but it is something to, to mention. 
When Chavez got to power, the oil barrel price was at its lowest, eight dollars per oil barrel. So that's the lowest that it has been. And Venezuela, that was dependent on almost 70 percent of the country revenue, was because of the oil, was very dependent of the oil price. So all of this connected to, you know, a sense that it's not that the country was pushing um, or was good. No, the country was very bad. And those were the symptoms. The sickness basically was, was Chavez. So, so Chavez is, is the result of the symptoms that the society had. But there is a change. When I was in my late teens, early 20s, around 2003, 2004, I was following the situation in Venezuela very closely. And myself and a friend had decided to invest in a Canadian gold mining company that was meant to mine gold in Venezuela. Crystalex? Yes, <laughs> exactly. The, so we were young and, and naive and thought, hey, like we're going to invest in this company that is going to mine in Venezuela. Of course, as you know, uh, knowing this company, that didn't work out. But what we were really inspired in our young kind of ideals at the time, I think, is that Chavez embodied a character that was going to free the people, right? Like he was a man of the people and he was going to liberate the poor Venezuelans, the uneducated. He was going to liberate those people and give them what they deserved, which was, you know, the money and the profits from Venezuelan resources. And that he was against and he was an agent of change and he was against the institutions that were robbing the Venezuelan uh, people. And there was almost like this divide that you talk about. From our perspective, there seemed to be like divide between the working class and richer educated class. And I didn't get this and I didn't get the authoritarianism aspect until I moved to France and met Venezuelans, like actual Venezuelans, you know, people like you who left the country and they were like, no, Chavez is a monster. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, this is a man who's going to like free the Venezuelan people. I think it's very relevant today, especially like with, you know, Trump and everything, that these anti-establishment platform that Trump ran on is kind of very similar to that of Chavez. All right, maybe Trump is, is not, uh, you know, like a working class person, but it appeals to a certain demographic, I think. And that's what makes it so interesting and appealing. I agree. And to be honest, Trump is more like latest years Chavez than early year Chavez. And I will put you this example. Chavez got a coup on 2002, and he suffered a coup. He did. And the revolution will not be televised. It's such a great documentary. Yeah. Exactly. And on the third day, he came back to power. He was brought out by the people. He came back to power. You know, the biggest four private TV channels were um, the ones organizing partly or organizers of the coup, like Many of the militaries um, of the top commanders military were part of the coup. And he's brought back to power. He goes out that night on the balcony of, on the, or equivalent to the White House that is Mila Flores. And we have a balcony that is, is named the Balcony of the People. He comes out with, you know, thousands and thousands of people cheering his, his name because he just got back to power right after being in jail. He comes back and the people that were supporters of Chavez were mad. They were enraged because somebody tried to take their hero. Well, the U.S. tried to take their hero. Right? I mean, this was the U.S.-backed coup, was it not? The U.S. say that they didn't were backing the coup. It's of everyone to judge. But they supported the new government once that the new government came to power. What is interesting, that was the government that came to power for, for the coup. And this new government actually eliminated the constitution, eliminated all the laws that Chavez and did, eliminated the Supreme Court, and was chasing the supporters of Chavez, and they were throwing out to jail and, and punching them. It was a witch hunt of what was happening there. And just to refer you how different, or how this Chavez character, how different was, and how changed uh, over time for several reasons, he came to the balcony of the people, and he says that, asked to all his supporters to go back home in peace when his supporters were like looking for war. He was calling for the whole country a reconciliation. He was acknowledging for the people that criticize him and that he will try to change their mind. But even if he can't, he will be his president. 
and you know it's like calling for a reconciliation of the country after suffering such a hard coup this is just something that you don't expect out of that and i'm not saying that he wasn't authoritarian and he had some very bad military characteristics but that was the figure of chavez in the front of the eyes of many people and what is interesting besides all of the corruption and the characteristics that the government of, of chavez was built on that was this authoritarian populistic figure of Chavez, the one that made all, all, all the rules, after 2005. In 2005, the opposition decided to not, to don't go to general elections for the Venezuelan Congress at the time. And they gave 100% of the Congress to Chavez. And they decided to don't go because they say that the elections were tricked. And it was going to be, you know, they were going to illegitimize Chavez if they didn't go to the election. The reality of what happened is that Chavez got control of 100% of Congress. So you can imagine what will happen here if the U.S. Congress is 100% controlled by uh, Donald Trump and 20% of the world. That, that is such a dangerous thing to actually happen. What happened with the full control of the Venezuelan Congress? He got the full control of the Supreme Court. He got the full control of every um, uh, major office. And he became kind of a monarch because the whole structure was already centered on the figure of Chavez. And now every government body was completely controlled by Chavez because the opposition didn't participate in, in, in that election. So that is sickening of what he actually right after that. He has so much power. He closed the head of that was the biggest a private TV channel back at the time. He started expropriating different medias and start, you know, crushing political leaders and putting them into jail. He becomes a person that was unable, an untouchable person that nobody could defy him because there was no balance. And on contrast, just for example, on contrast, in 2002, the coup that he received, actually the Supreme Court said that there was no coup that Chavez had no coup, that there was vacancy of power because Chavez wasn't there. That was uh, what the Supreme Court said. And actually the, the same Supreme Court, like one year after, sanctioned Chavez for something that he said on TV. So there was balance of power, very similar to what is here in the US, but we gave him like the red carpet to be, hey, you can be as authoritarian as you want because we are not gonna fight our democratic uh, institution. So yes, the opposition had also responsibility on that, on, on allowing to an authoritarian guy that many people already knew to have such kind of power and such a big pocket that he, he had. Because not only in his term, the oil went from $8 per barrel, but it went all the way up, up until $147 per barrel. And besides that increase on our oil revenue, he increased the debt of the country by 60 times. So you can imagine and this whole context that is happening. And then when he is going to Cuba to treat his cancer, he knows that he is very sick and he sits um, in a table and next to him is Maduro that, you know, Maduro was like somebody on the political sphere, but it wasn't like a popular political sphere or many people thought that was going to be this battle um, that was like the right hand of Chavez for so many years. And he sits uh, over there and he tells to his support. At this point, the currency crisis hasn't happened yet. Not that it hasn't happened. There was still 17, 25, 35 yearly inflation. Capital controls was, were actually established in 2002 in the capital controls. And, and the capital controls over time were more strict. At the beginning, were more light. But there was an, a, a crisis. But because we had so much oil money coming, basically, Venezuelans were kind of like living um, a borrowed life. Just to tell you this, this example, a painter in Latin America is a working class job that he paints houses. He would be able with, um, you know, his money and his salary to go on vacation to Madrid. And then he comes back to Venezuela with more money 
because basically was subsidized uh, everything and they give you money in order to go. And then when he comes back, he buys a taxi and he starts renting the taxi. So that was, you know, the kind of crazy living that we have, uh, particularly on the mid uh, 2000s, uh, like from 2005 up until 2010. We had that even through we had the inflation and everything, but it's, it's also because of, of the amount of revenue that we were having coming from the oil sector. And so when did the current, did it sort of correlate with the crash in oil prices that happened a couple of years ago? Not only that, but that is the reason that I was referring to how Maduro gets power. When Maduro gets to power, Chavez asked to his supporters that if he is sick, if he dies for any reason, if something happens to him, he asked them and ordered them to vote strictly for Maduro. And he gave a blade to Maduro in that moment. So he was like almost transferring power to, Ma- to Maduro. And this mythical figure that has been created that is unbeatable, electorally, um, with tons of money, so charismatic, with scoops and everything. And this mythical figure told his supporters to vote uh, for Chavez. Then in March 2013, Chavez died. And in 30 days, are the elections, the elections that Maduro is a, is a candidate. So basically the whole country was still in a duel and he comes to power, but Maduro he has no actual leverage and has no actually support from the Venezuelan society, from the different- He's not as charismatic as Chavez. No, it wasn't as charismatic, but also he was like, is Chavez is the reason that he got into power. It was very hard for him to change his policies on every aspect. So anything that Chavez said was basically like a Bible for him to follow because he couldn't defy his predecessor because his predecessor was the one that named him president, basically. His power comes from Chavez's legacy, basically. And so he can't defy Chavez's legacy. Exactly. So not only that the price of the oil barrel collapsed, that has nothing to do with Maduro coming to power. But, you know, the whole debt that the country has created, the whole corruption scheme that it has created, the whole no uh, investing that money or, or saving that money for harder times or for being more productive, the collapse of the private companies because expropriating them and going against them because it was very easy for us to import. Everything of that is happening. Suddenly, we cannot get more debt and the oil revenue collapse. And at the same time, Maduro cannot change the economic policies that were designed for $147 per oil barrel and with that amount of debt and with that amount of support. So internally, the Venezuelan regime had, you know, like so many directions. Maduro didn't control politically the party as, as Chavez did because there were so many different ways. And he found himself trapped in some way. Uh, politically speaking, because if he removed one of the main policies of Chavez, he could have, you know, somebody from his party to actually uh, counter him or to actually don't care about what um, he was saying. So he had the option to actually do it. But politically speaking, it was very hard for him to do it, which because we didn't took the actions that were necessary over the following years, 2013, 2014, uh, particularly starting in 2014, inflation started to, um, to grow as the whole system is, is collapsing in 2015. With the price controls, there is a scarcity of food and medicine, of toilet paper, of many, many goods that are scarcity uh, because of the price controls were pegged to an official dollar that was basically non-existent because the government wasn't giving you uh, official dollars and the people wasn't able to get them legally on the market. I mean, talking about this legally because the legal aspects are important on a real economy. Because we, for example, on on the crypto, we always like, you know, you know, uh, Bitcoin is uncensorable. It's, you know, completely free. But the reality is that when you think in, in, in a real mass adoption, when you're thinking in millions of people on the financial institutions, on, on the corporations that make the, the imports into a country, you need to, to think that they need to comply. And they need to, to comply not particularly with Colombia or with the US, they need to comply with the law where they are registered. 
because they are over there registered in, in Venezuela and somebody will, will go if you don't comply and will shut down your business. Hundreds or thousands of, of jobs could be lost and, you know, the whole investment of, of anyone could be lost. And if you're importing into Venezuela, your tariffs are denominated in bolivars and if everything is denominated, their taxes are in that. And so that sort of creates a system where even if this currency is inflating like crazy, it still makes everyone tied to it. You still need to have it in order to pay your taxes and everything. So at the end of 2015, there was a um, hyperinflation was uh, starting kicking and the scarcity was in his top expression. And that's like one of the reasons that the opposition won by a landslide and their elections in December 2015. I'm talking that they won 113 deputies out of 186 or something like that. I'm, I'm, forgot uh, the, um, the complete, the total number, but it was more than um, two thirds of the Congress, which allowed the opposition basically to do whatever they wanted. But from the get go, the government tried to fight back. They name a, a new Supreme Court and that Supreme Court say that the people from the National Assembly, two deputies were invalid, so they didn't have the Supreme, the two thirds of the AN. I mean, there was a political conflict happening between a regime that is uh, has is authoritarian and is corrupted, and they are trying to hold on power, and there is this opposition that wants to get rid of that government as soon as possible and as fast as possible, because that's um, what the opposition sees as the solution. That we all agree. We all agree that the solution is, you know, removing Maduro from power and having a new government. But the reality that we need to face is that we cannot have a country divided. We cannot govern a country or enter or trying to claim the power without many of the people that, that are over there. And that mistake and that conflict elevated the political battle and created a whole political crisis once again. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we can, you know, we could talk for hours and hours about like, you know, the political crisis that's happened. Uh, but let, let's try to uh, focus in on sort of now how was your calling of how you thought to solve the problem. And so tell us a little bit about why you thought cryptocurrency was a solution to the problem and where was cryptocurrency something that was already happening in Venezuela by the time you got there or was it still not were people using it by that time or not and how if so starting to tell your last question you can basically check google trends and see the keywords of bitcoin or blockchain or crypto in Venezuela before december 2017 and you, uh, it's basically a small group of people, and but that is not even recorded on on the Google Trends, like the the actual numbers and on, on, on how or how much it was searched. The reason there was a reason for um, for that, even by having the you know the cheapest electricity of the world, uh, as you you may know, the reason is that. We, because we had capital controls, many government officials were actually taking advantage of the lack of regulation and were blackmailing people that either hold crypto, mine crypto, or work with crypto. And they were blackmailing them, accusing them of, you know, random rules that weren't directly connected, but it's like, you're affecting the electoral grid or you didn't import this with a permit or you uh, are violating the capital controls. Many people thought, because it, it is the common, the common thing to, to actually in, in a corrupt system as ours uh, and because of the capital controls, that the industry was practically banned by the Venezuelan regime. I remember in October 2017 that I went to a conference in New York. Uh, I was making an ICO uh, over there in Venezuela. 
And people, I was the only Venezuelan on that conference. Well, me and like two other friends. And I was like the curious uh, person, like people asking me about the inflation over there in Venezuela and also asking me, hey, aren't you afraid that you're going to be detained or going to be in jail? Because the, the, the news and the stories about the crypto industry, both externally and internally in Venezuela, w was about the regime is against the cryptocurrency, which is partially not true. <laughs> and why is partially not, uh, not true? Because as an entrepreneur, when I dig dive into, into crypto, and again, I dig dive as an entrepreneur with a company with more than uh, 20 employees that I have to actually look for for the regulations before I decide to write random code on myself or, or something like that. That, again, quote unquote, I'm not a coder, uh, I'm a lawyer. That is um, a misinterpretation on the, on the New York Times article that they put me like that. But when I dig on, on the law, I, I realize, and when I dig on, on the research, I realize that the Venezuelan regime hasn't actually made a statement related to cryptocurrency. Uh, not the president, not the vice president, not the ministers. They haven't actually mentioned the word cryptocurrency. So it was impossible that the regime had a, an actual stance related to cryptocurrency. And what was happening was at a lower level that were basically cops and corrupt, and corrupt cops that, that is, you know, on the most corrupt system of, of the world. You can imagine that there are many corrupt people, but that wasn't a, a, a political position. Uh, and it wasn't politicized. The opposition hasn't even talked about cryptocurrencies. They are fighting on the context of elections. They are fighting on the context of the constitutional national assembly that the government is saying for political rights. There are other hustles going on. Cryptocurrencies are not a flag on the opposition either. So it's like a, a, a place that hasn't been held by any political party or, or political group in, in, in Venezuela. And that is a very good opportunity to try to persuade anyone to make them understand that it's, it's, uh, it's a path that will bring benefits to the whole society. And why do I see crypto as a solution and how do I see them uh, as a solution? Well, particularly I was involved in crypto since 2014. I knew them from, from before, but in, in a, at a personal level since 2014. Then when I arrived back to Venezuela, that I uh, arrived with my ex-wife, she couldn't open a bank account because she was a foreigner. We fought all, well, almost for a year uh, to actually get her a bank account. The bureaucracy in banking in Venezuela is incredible. As it is everywhere. Yeah, you know, my employees earn in dollars. I pay them in dollars back at, uh, at the time. But I, initially, we were only three people in my company, me and two other persons and the third uh, really quick. But as we started to grow, and we started to grow because we were working completely uh, for our internal projects and investors from outside and also offering service to clients on sites. So as we start to grow and we start to, to hire more people, out of, just for example, out of 16, uh, yeah, out of 16 employees, only one had a bank account, a, a USD bank account, uh, which he, he was the one that I had to deposit to. And then he made like a small trades with friends for the people when they requested. So that was very complex to actually pay my, my employees. They had problems actually opening PayPal's account because they needed validation. The easiest way to pay them actually was through crypto. Uh, it was way more easier uh, to pay them through, uh, through cryptocurrency. And over, over time, there were you know, the problems with the limits of the debit cards and the limits of the credit cards uh, and the problems with the cash because of hyperinflation. If you see videos of how uh, uh, Hyperinflation behaves in 2016, 2017. It's, it's crazy how it goes. So cash became worthless. The limits of the debit cards, if you pay something on Friday night, you couldn't pay through the next day or, or because of the, the, the limit. The credit cards limits were outdated. So nobody used, used credit cards uh, over there. And so 
everything you had to pay through a wire transfer. You had to make a wire transfer for paying even a cab or to paying for groceries. It was completely crazy. So if you go, if you went to a liquor store or to a grocery store, you will see um, like a line of computers where people will go and log in into their bank account and make a wire transfer to the uh, to the bank or to the liquor store. That that is how things were working out. Developing tech uh, tech projects, I was involved with many developers and creative and, and you know my goal of uh, finding solutions in, in Venezuela. And we started working on a POS system that will be able to connect to the financial system in Venezuela. And people will be able to pay directly through crypto and will convert directly to Bolivars, pay to the merchants in, in, in Bolivar. So I started working on, on the project. I actually started doing some tests with credit card. We advanced in, in that project for, um, for a few. Credit card was the biggest uh, switch in Venezuela. That is the system that interconnects the different POS and the banks. And, 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 credit, and credit card, they have like 86% of, of the market in Minnesota. We started doing tests, but because we are advancing on, on this, that's where I basically uh, start to research on the legal context of what was happening on in the industry. And as more research that I, that I do, I find that because of what is happening on in the industry, uh, that is basically being blackmailed by uh, the corrupt cops. We are not de developing solutions. The Venezuelan people are not developing solutions or the potential solutions that could be developed in Venezuela that are needed in Venezuela that you don't face these challenges here in the US aren't being done because it's not possible to actually implement them at a scale. So at the same time, I realized, okay, this is not something that probably I will be able to solve myself, even through I really bet on me. <laughs> but uh, this is something that goes way beyond is because there is this opportunity over here. Even if we are not able to develop this POS system, we are going to basically eliminate the capital controls if cryptocurrencies are allowed, because you have the capital controls that uh, prohibit you to actually exchange your bolivars to uh, to dollars that are not in an official way. If out of the sudden you allow private money, you basically allow the access to the international market, and you are at the same time allow to any uh, project being developed in cryptocurrency to be basically implemented. So that that would be a game changer, and that is uh, when we start to to work in our strategy to work and to, to go out of the shadows. And instead of being hidden, instead of, you know, writing articles or I, more strategy was to go as public as possible. We were a company in Venezuela, the Wall Street Journal went to actually make um, a story about us because we were growing in the midst of, of, the, of the chaos that, that we had in, in Venezuela. So we had certain authority over there in Venezuela and we decided Let's use this and let's talk about crypto, not about our projects. Let's talk about how good, um, how cryptocurrencies could be a solution for payments, how cryptocurrencies could be a solution for saving, how cryptocurrencies could be a solution for avoiding hyperinflation. And on the pitching side, we have to, you have to understand that the Venezuelan regime, we had to be, cryptocurrencies had to be appealing for them. And in order to be appealing for them, they had a big problem back at the time in 2016, 2017. Like it was their enemy, basically. That was a website named Dollar Today. That is a, a website that shows the price of the black market of the dollar. Basically, what the way that we portrayed our speech on conferences, on the media, on news articles over there in, in, in Venezuela was that with cryptocurrencies, people wouldn't need the US dollar. And because they wouldn't need the US dollar, uh, the demand and, and the pressure on the dollar will decrease and the economy will alleviate on the black market uh, that is, is making that push and that is not uh, being able to actually transact freely because it's subject, because it's black market, it's subject to control. 
And so that's what the government got interested in, and that's why they reached out to you? That 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 was my speech, or, or our speech in different times. At the same time, in order to not be alone, we started to gather other entrepreneurs in Venezuela that were of the crypto industry back at the time. And it happened something magic that nowadays is completely different. And what happens in, in many countries is completely different because we were all threatened to be in jail, basically. And, and that was a, a, a danger, an actual danger. Uh, there was no discussion about Ethereum or Bitcoin or Dash, or whatever. We were all uh, on the crypto industry. And we were all out there speaking about the benefits uh, of, of cryptocurrencies could have in, in, in our country. We gathered also, we basically created a, a community of entrepreneurs uh, that were decided after like we, we went out, many other people were also coming out with their projects and we created uh, like a, a, a movement towards that. Because of that, and because of the whole big crisis of what is happening, Maduro uh, regime, well, not the Maduro regime, the central bank, they realized that we are talking about the solutions to many of the problems that they had. And they wanted it to know what was actually happening uh, with, uh, with crypto. So they request me and um, other companies to make an explanation on cryptocurrencies at the central bank for a very small group, a technical group, then there were some, some directors of, of the central bank uh, at the time. What I find out on that meeting that was particularly interesting is that the central bank knew that they were creating inorganic money. They were doing the bear system and, and they knew the hyperinflation basically was created back then. So for example, when we were explaining Bitcoin and so on, and so on, they were like, hey, no, that's the antithesis of what we're doing. So they were looking at it like surprised and they very much knew the mistakes that they, and they had. But um, because and many of them had years and years of, uh, and, and the central bank. What I realized over there is that even through the central bank knows the mistakes that are not publicly telling that they know that they are doing it wrong. They are aware of the problems that they uh, that they have and they're actually, you know, interested in, in possible solution. There was one guy that showed a video that day, show a video of Chavez talking about the petrol. And he was saying to create an ICO of Perebesa and, and, and Petro. There were a bunch of, you know, directors over there, but there was no one with political power actually over there. But when I see that video, I realize on, on my head that if this is actually pitch to the right people that is able to make the decisions and everything follows, uh, uh, follows, and we portray that it's Chavez, the one that, uh, you know, created these policies that cannot be changed. But Chavez is the one that is creating this tool that is changing the whole spectrum. Uh, is, is Chavez itself the one that is going to change the, uh, the basically the legislation? This will be the pitching that they will be able to internalize as, okay, we can, uh, if we do this, we need to because we, we will do it for Chavez and we will fix all of these problems of, of the economy and will be an idea of Chavez if we, if, we, if we apply it. Was that your idea or was that someone else? Whose idea was that to do that little mind trick? That was my idea. The, the thing is that how I accidentally see that, uh, that video on that central bank meeting uh, and then because other people can contact me, Carlos Vargas can contact me because I was in the media, many people was contacting me. And when he tells me that he can show a deck to the, to the BP, if I had a, a project uh, and I mentioned, I mentioned him, well, we can actually put this name and we can actually tell that in order to materialize Chavez's idea, we have to make cryptocurrencies legal. We are gonna even make it for non-profit. I mean, we are not going to charge a, a, a dollar or a bolivar in order to do it. That would be a pitch that they will basically suggest. And we made a small speech, pitch deck of, of about nine pages. And we gave it to, to him. We literally were focusing on our different projects, still uh, publicly speaking, trying you know, to have a positive statement 
uh, from the government related to into the crypto. And then uh, after a conference in, in Venezuela that Maduro saw a Bitcoin mining machine and asked what was that, and he was told that was the future uh, of money that was blockchain. Uh, and he asked, hey, is this a Chavez idea? And they, uh, somebody told him that yes. He actually approved the project without actually understanding what cryptocurrencies or, uh, or, or what blockchain, what it actually meant. Why do you think that is? That he, why do you think that he just accepted it? Just because it was a Chavez idea? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and not only because it was a Chavez idea, but it was a Chavez idea that will fix all the problems of the economy that he was actually facing. Uh, so you had the problem of hy- hyperinflation, you have the, um, the problem of payments, you have the problem of cash, uh, and you would basically not need the US dollar if you have a cryptocurrency that is freely tradable all over the world. And, and this was like a sweet spot that is conceptualized by Chavez. And it's, it's like, wow, that, that is amazing. And they approve it without actually really knowing uh, about it. And not, it's, it's something that I say with complete confidence. And that's something that the, the New York Times uh, validated uh, with um, interviewing people that were close and government officials that, that, that were clo- um, close to that. But not even like internally approving it, right? Like, you know, from the article, what I got was like, he went on national television and said, we are doing this. Yes. How does it, how does that happen? Like, how does he like, without even having an idea of what this is, just go on national television and tell everyone? This is the point. We have the biggest oil reserve of, of the world. And like the, between the second and fifth, depends of, of, the, of the studies, uh, coal reserve of the world. So many natural resources. Uh, only 30 million people, and we have the worst economic crisis of the world. So as you may guess about it, the people handling the economy and making the decisions related to the economy, having all of these resources and being you know, on this big crisis when we were like a very good nation, it, they are terrible at making policies, decisions, uh, are handling uh, important topics. And they are actually handled like that. You can talk with many people um, uh, that has work or has any to do anything to do with uh, the Venezuelan regime. What you will expect, you know, a long bureaucracy in many areas. When is you know the top person, if he feels that that is the right way, they just approve it. And they literally, you know, the three days I was in Bogota, I, I changed my flight to the um, to the next day, and then I go back to to Venezuela. They were asking me about what mining was, if mining was equivalent to have a US dollar account and, and create that, if uh, how many pictures there would be, like uh, what, um, what was a blockchain, like uh, I'm talking with the vice president, the minister of science, they, they literally knew anything, anything related to crypto. I, I, I was like, when in that first meeting, is that I realized they didn't actually understood what they just put so they launched this crypto they announced and you can like this video of maduro announcing this on television and he's very sure of himself and he's very confident that this project will go through meanwhile in the background nobody knows anything nothing absolutely nothing the only one that had the project on his mind was me <laughs> and they were calling me to ask me how was the project like when are we going to launch it um, how many petros are there going to be? Uh, how is it going to be mineable or not? Why is it not going to be mineable? We want, we want to mine it to have dollars. You know, that, that were their thoughts. How, how is it trade? So is, is people in New York going to be able to get it? Like they had complete no understanding uh, about this. Given that opportunity, given that lack of, uh, of knowledge of what, uh, and given the ignorance of what, uh, what was happening is when I realized this is, an actual opportunity to create a blockchain um, explorer that actually oversees the government spending. If we are able to to actually implement this crypto, particularly the petrol, besides the legalization of uh, of cryptocurrencies, we are going to be able to see how money is moved 
we are going to be able to identify who is moving and which money from which government entity and in a corrupt system as, as, as the Venezuelan one. That is, uh, you know, incredible. And this is not something that I, 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 if you see, I actually on December 22nd of, the, of that year, I made a speech at the Central Bank in Venezuela in front of the uh, cabinet. Uh, economic government because they basically opened me the doors to everything. I uh, met with the president in his private house in Puerto Tuna, that is the biggest military base of, of Caracas. Uh, I had access to any minister or any office. They, they were ordered to do whatever I demanded. I go over all the government regulatory bodies uh, and they they approve everything that I, I, I was um, I was saying because basically I had the blessing of the dictator because the dictator embodied that, particularly on that December 22, that I went over there with a few Americans that we were talking on, on the central bank and, and, and talking to these people, telling them, hey, we are going to fight corruption. This is going to be transparent. And the people is going to be able to audit uh, spending. This is what you're telling them. This is what you were saying. Yes. And not only saying, but that's what we were building. And that's what they were approving. And that's what the legislation on the other side that I was creating. They, they, why were they approving this? Like, you know, why was the corrupt government sort of signing off on saying, yeah, we want more transparency into our corruption? Uh, well, in Venezuela, basically, it's because of the populist guy said so. So um, people didn't understood very well what crypto were, uh, but Maduro said that we have to do it. So because Maduro said that we have to do it, everyone was following on. Of course, I knew from the beginning that that was going to be a very small window, a very small window that, that you know, ignorance was going to, um, to remain. For that reason, I strategically placed to launch the, um, the ICO by February 20th. This is, you know, we, you have been involved in crypto projects. So basically we are like at 1% on December 3rd. Uh, we haven't even conceptualized any white paper or anything. You know, we wear an office that we pay $40 per month. At, at the time we have more than 50 people, uh, but and we basically had zero, but I pushed it to put it on February because I wanted to implement it and to release it before they were able to hold it and to stop it. That was my bet. Basically, they actually tried to stop the project and they uh, started to jeopardize the, the project. And the one that was commanding uh, basically all of that was the Minister of Finance himself, the one that was losing the grip and the power of the, of the economy because he wasn't even you know, on, on the decision making on, on this. As you see Maduro approving the project or anything afterwards, he wasn't on the table because this was something that were brought, brought by, was from Chavez and so on, and was approved. So by January, they start going, bringing, they, they bring a Russian team uh, that they were scammers. They declare me enemy of the state and they declare- oh, Sorry, who was this Russian team? I, I, I read about this Russian team. Can you disclose who they were? At the end of January, when I was going to publish the white paper, uh, they tell me the day before that I have to eliminate the authorship and I have to eliminate the technological part of the white paper, which basically will leave the white paper itself as a shell and could be man manipulated later on. And at least the authorship that it was a foundation will guarantee that we will deploy it that day. So after it's signed by the president, the white paper and publicly say that it was John Venezuela the one that did it. I challenged the Minister of Finance and published the white paper with the um, authorship, with the authorship of uh, that, that we were ourselves to say, uh, because that way, the next week, we would put it the technological part because that was what was promised to, um, to us. So it was like a guarantee that they don't steal the project that uh, was ours. So when I published that, they sent me the political police, they declared me enemy of the state to me and the foundation. And then they basically told me because the project was of the foundation, we weren't owners of the project anymore. So who declared you enemy of the state? It was the finance ministry that did it? 
Uh, no, the, the, the vice president, uh, Tarek Al-Aysami. So the vice president was on your side up until then. So what, what changed? No, no, he wasn't on my side. He was over there when, uh, you know, was approved and, and then explained to him the basics and then saw him when I went to the, uh, to the house of Maduro and, and Fuerte Tuna. But uh, he, he wasn't particularly on my side. And actually the vice president palace is right in front of the minister of finance. So, the, and as you can imagine, they are like the two most corrupt people uh, on on the country. So, actually, he declared me an enemy of the state because I challenged the Ministry of uh, of Finance. Uh, so, I the prayer wasn't ours anymore. Basically, I knew that they would try to manipulate the the project or to do something else. I, I, my strategy was, well, they have the ICO in about four weeks. They need me. Uh, they will, they will not find anyone else that is going to be able to pull this player off in such a short time because they haven't done anything. It's completely impossible that they do it. Uh, that was my, my thought at the, at one week after that, they call me and they, they tell me, well, I cannot be part of the project or either the foundation, it has to be a Venezuelan company, but we have to compete uh, with another team that they are not going to tell us who they are. Uh, so my sources internally from uh, from the people of, of the superintendency told me that they were Russians. We, some team members and we, the only company of, of the different companies that uh, integrated the foundation to, uh, that said yes was myself to actually put his name on it. And the reason that I did that it was because I didn't want the project to fall and, and to be not uh, uh, implemented. Like I already was involved into it and I didn't want it to, to fail. And after the first night, we go to a restaurant. I was waiting downstairs in, in the Ministry of Finance. And when we are dining on that restaurant, there is a Russian team uh, eating and celebrating and it was like 11 p.m. Uh, and it was very late already and it was weird to see uh, like foreign people in Venezuela uh, doing that. So we actually, hey, do you think this is the people? We randomly asked them and they told us uh, who they were, uh, that they were there for doing the petrol and we were like completely surprised because the petrol was a project. We didn't have a contract or anything, but the petrol was our creation and and they were telling us that they were doing the petrol. So they tell us their names and we uh, decided to do a research about who they were. And there was a model, there was a um, yoga teacher, uh, there, there was a, a former uh, fraudulent guy from, that was sanctioned by the US and the CME and Chicago for doing fraudulent transactions. So th there were basically completely pe random people and you know with no actual background on what they were going to supposed to do. And they were there celebrating that they were going to do the petrol, uh, you know, the project that I, I, I was creating in order to fight this uh, scheme and, and that I announced that it will create this transparency and so on and the legislation that was underlying it. Uh, underlying it. So I created a, a brief uh, and I presented myself. I, did, I say that I didn't care that I was an enemy of the state, but I wasn't going to uh, let this project uh, die and I went to the Ministry of Finance, to the Superintendency, and to the Ministry of Science, and I g gave them uh, a brief uh, saying that those people were scammers. Those Russians were fraudulent. They were fraudulent um, people, and they were um, they were scammers. The team uh, that they were doing. They didn't react. They told me that I was jealous uh, because there was a Russian team that, that was better th than us. Uh, and that's how they reacted, <laughs> which, is, which is completely, completely nuts. Uh, so I actually tried to fight that back. And they actually tell me that it's actually OK. The Russian team desisted. It's, guys, you are going to be the ones that are going to pull it off. And, Going to finally going to implement it and deploy the project and so on. 
They told us to, to go to the um, uh, vice president palace. Over there, we give them the documentation, wallets. If we do adjustment to the, to the websites and so on, uh, like for around eight hours that, uh, that day, up until 8 uh, p.m. And then in that moment, around 8 p.m., arrived the Russians to the to the main room of the vice president's silence. That is the Simon Bolivar room. That is where the ministries meet uh, on television and they're making decisions and so on. And over there, they arrive and they arrive with uh, champagne bottles. Uh, and they start doing champagne showers in front of the Venezuelan seal and taking selfies and they uh, sign the, in the contract on the development of the project. <laughs> so uh, right in front of our faces. I was over there with um, uh, an engineer from another company, but that was working in, in, together with, with us. And it was unbelievable. They, they signed the contract that we were supposed to sign and that we were signing it in a <laughs> pro bono uh, way. And well, then they, they came and I told them, hey, what is happening? And they told me, well, no, they are doing the petrol, but, but it's, it's a pay. You were, you were told, no, don't worry, you're going to still be able to sell it. And I refuse to actually, I'm not going to sell something that I'm not doing because it's a fraud. Uh, and that people is fraudulent. I already told you that it's fraudulent, uh, fraudulent people. They come out with a contract and that they were offering money and so on. I, I refused to sign that. And I told them, I need to, uh, to actually, uh, because I knew that I had that only moment to rescue the project. So after there is a collapse on the website that my friend is able to mimic the website on national television and so on, he comes back to wh where I was, that I was negotiating with um, the main aid of, of economics of, of the country at the vice president palace comes the chief of staff of the vice president that actually was indicted two days ago uh, by the U.S., by the Department of Justice, Jose Lid Ramirez. And he um, come out screaming uh, and ordering our detention and ordering us that we are not uh, leaving. And if we try to communicate with a tear war, we were going to be sent to the, the Hesim. He ordered us to make uh, several other corrections that he wanted and that we will only be free whenever he wanted, if he wanted. And he ordered the guards to come, the military guards that protect the military palace. And they pointed us on, on the guns and they told us that we actually had to, if we tried to do anything, we knew very well what, what would happen. So all of that happened in, in, in that moment. So, so the military police comes in and basically under the pressure of being shot or the threat of being shot, you're told now, okay, you have to do what we do what we want. Yeah. Finish us. Yes, exactly. Exactly that. And basically it was because I was denying myself to actually sign that document that they were offering a document that was basically saying that I was going to sell a project that was a fraud. Uh, and that I was already telling them that was these people was a fraud, and and I want I wasn't going to be able to sell it. Did it occur to you at any point that this could happen? That things could escalate? I mean, like you know, you're dealing with gangsters, basically. I mean, if you you should sort of extrapolate yourself from this story, like you're effectively dealing with gangsters. Did did it occur to you that it you know? It, when you started working on this project in the beginning that at any point your life might be in danger? Yes, completely. But this is a question that I faced internally myself. There is a slim opportunity, a very slim opportunity to actually change something that will do good for many people that will eliminate the capital control that could create something for more than 20 years, nothing else has worked. You have fought against it, you have rallied, you have protested, you have worked in the US against it. You came back to the country to actually, with the hope of change, those hopes have uh, deflated. There, there was a slim opportunity with my, not my hands, but with my team and, 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 and us to try to actually do something that will change the life of millions. And we dream about it. And we said, yes, let's, let's try. 
we, this was a big discussion team. I lost a partner uh, when we decided to actually try this, but it was a risk that it worth for for the possibility of change because I'm I'm not the kind of person and I uh, that's the reason that I'm here on the bay. I'm not gonna wait for the politicians to bring solutions for Air Forces. They have failed us greatly in 20 years. They have failed us greatly. And I'm not a, a, a guy of guns. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm very skinny. I cannot even fight, but I can try to put ideas out there and, and try to build a solution for problems that people is, is failing. And I'm not gonna stop either way, even while I was in Venezuela, I'm not gonna be saying like many Venezuelans does, I'm just gonna wait for the government to change, to build something. No, people need now. People need solutions now because that stupid government is affecting them. Um, that is, is, it's creating this whole crisis and people are suffering right, uh, right now. So I'm not just gonna turn my, my, my I to the other side and just say, no, this is this is something that the Venezuelan government will need to be part of. And no, it's something that is completely for the people. I will uh, I will be the first one to actually try to help the people of uh, uh, of my country. And I'm going to wait for anyone to leave because I'm even disappointed with the people of the opposition uh, and with the leader of the opposition of my country because they are with the worst government in history. And as on the history of Venezuela that has created this economic crisis, they haven't been able to overtake power. You know, so how bad is our opposition? Are they going to always play the victim? Oh, no, is that the Venezuelan government is really bad? Is that they are terrorists? Yes, we, we know that they are. We know that they're investors, such as I knew. And I'm responsible also for all the criticism, for the collateral damage that I caused, for, for, for the manipulation that was caused because of the project, because I tried to do something else. That was completely, completely different. But, but by my actions and by my ideas, I created a project that ended being used for um, manipulation of the Venezuelan people. And that's something that, that is a pain and that I, you know, every podcast, every news, everything that, um, that I do, or every story uh, about me, there are always going to be Venezuelans saying, you know, that I was being paid, uh, that I stole billions, that... Uh, I paid you or you are doing a PR campaign. And I have to accept that because it's completely understandable of people that have been oppressed and repressed for, for, um, for so many. And I see a guy that, you know, the tool with whatever intention that I had and has been used to, to manipulate and oppress people. That is something that, that I carry on, on myself. But either way, it's not something that is going to stop me to keep trying and to keep building. And even through, through my failures and my lessons, I will try to, from, from outside, bring solutions to the Venezuelan society. That's the reason that I'm, I'm really happy that I landed here in, in the Bay Area. Thanks, Sonny, again, for that invitation that really changed. Uh, from that moment, I literally came with you know a backpack and my clothes that, that I had on because do you remember that we bought the ticket from one day to the other and, and, and then the other day was coming coming back and I was invited, hey, do, do you want to stay with us for a week and, and hang and, and see what project you, you're trying to do or and we can help you out and you can advise us and we started to to, to collaborate like that and, and trying, I've been trying to bring people together that, that is looking to build for for the present and not for the future of Venezuela. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, it was a risk, but it was like the opportunity that you had and you had to seize it when, when it was there. And so what what's the like current state of the project now? So, you know, you managed to get out and now you have asylum in the U.S. Um, did the project ever actually launch? Who's running it now? Is it still ever going to be launched? Do you keep up with it in that sense? Well, the project itself uh, was kind of like held in a, a standby. And then because they didn't want the project to actually happen, but they publicly already said that it was going to be the pillar of the economy. So they tried later on to pivot the project in something that they would be able to control and something that they would be, be able to do whatever they wanted. But they, they, have failed to actually launch a functional product 
related to to the petrol. They have relaunched it several times. And again, it, it, people people like to say that it's, it's a project for money laundering or corruption or whatever, but or avoiding sanctions or so on. There are other cryptocurrencies that are much better fit uh, and has the liquidity. If the government wants actually to do uh, anything of that, and that they don't need to ask permission to anyone because they are the law, <laughs> you know. So so the project what ended up being used for is basically manipulation, telling to the people, hey, yes, we are going to pay you half of a petrol uh, if you subscribe to this fatherland card. Uh, and that is $30, according to their imaginary. Uh, and, and that's what they, they use it for. And that has, has been the, the way that they have been publicly telling to the people selling this idea to uh, to the people every time with a petrol okay we're going to give you half of a petrol they send the half of a petrol to a portal and people then try to trade it's it probably not even on a blockchain right uh, there is uh but they have pivoted on it several times too so it's most mostly mostly an sql uh, database <laughs> uh, more than a uh, more than a blockchain they sometimes habilitate a blockchain explorer or explorer they make like a clone of of dash um, on their last development that, that they did but they they haven't uh, actually deployed and implemented a, a public blockchain or or anything closely similar to that do you think that there was a world in which the Petro might have worked? So like, let's say, let's say if it was backed by OPEC, do you think that could have been, the problem was that it was overly associated with Venezuela. And I think part of like what led to the failure of it was the, when the US sanctions came down on it and that kind of like was the nail in the coffin for the project. So how could things have gone differently in your mind that like maybe this could have worked? I would have implemented the project on the first week of January. We would have implemented that in the project. There was no actually back to the oil barrel. There was a price of acceptance for the state. And the actual value of the petrol itself was that the state was backing it. Even if, if it is the worst state possible and the one that you lack trust and is the most corrupt and, and everything, he will always accept the price of the petrol at the price of the oil barrel. They are not giving you all the, they are not paying you, but he's accepting it at that price. That means that oil taxes uh, are are paid from the oil companies that are, are extracting oil are being paid and on petrol, uh, could be paid by petrol using that reference, that uh, services that any tax or any government contract uh, could be paid and anything um, will be always accepted to uh, to that uh, to that price. That was the actual value, and that was encouraged for the whole country to actually do so. The potential market of what the petro had is bigger than it still nowadays. The whole cryptocurrency industry had only with the Venezuelan with the Venezuelan people. That for me was uh, very valuable, and if it will have been for the Minister of Finance coming in by late January and trying to stop the project uh, because he was kind of still figuring out by late December, early January, what was that uh, about? We would have been able to set it. I don't think that the actual peg with the oil uh, would have actually made any difference. And actually, there is a confusion with people who are saying, well, the petrol is the oil, you're going to give me the oil. Maduro trying to explain the petro created that confusion. If you see the white paper, that is what you need to see if you are analyzing a cryptocurrency. There is no actual peg to the uh, to the old barrel. The main reason for that it was un- unconstitutional against the law, and I didn't want to uh, compromise the future of my country by uh, creating technically futures of uh, of the petro for. Uh, creating revenue to uh, to the Venezuelan government that is going to, going to end up in corrupt pockets. So basically, it, it, if they are uh, issuing one petrol because there was going to be a limit of 100, if they're issuing one petrol, they are forcing themselves 
to actually accept it to the to the um, price of the old barrel. So that that is basically um, the way that we uh, we design it, and that would have worked, particularly in a context where the Venezuelan government wouldn't be a sanction as it is today, and the petrol wouldn't be a sanction as it is, to, is today. Because besides the technological facts, still the sanctions play a huge role, which makes you question also. Was it sanctioned because was there fear of the status quo of the U.S. dollar uh, by having a currency that could have rallied support from other states that are not particularly aligned with the um, U.S. and could use this currency without any intervention of the U.S. and therefore, in order to prevent that happen, they actually sanctioned it before it was even born, you know? So so that makes you question, uh, and those are valid, valid questions that, uh, that we will need to, to have. But again, from the U.S. perspective, that was a tool for manipulation, a tool for corruption, and that's the reason that they, uh, they sanctioned. And thanks to the sanction, actually, is the reason that I was able to escape from the project on March, that I was trying, uh, after I, I told the president again that the, uh, the Russians were fraudulent, that they weren't doing anything, that we had the project already done, and I tried to fight like a couple more weeks from February to March. And then on March, they threatened me again that I couldn't speak uh, against the project or the government, where I would be thrown out in, in jail. I was looking for ways to go out, and when the project was sanctioned, I used the sanction to say that I wasn't able to keep working on the project because I had, it wasn't the company of the project, but I had uh, an American company and I had family in the US and I couldn't keep working on the project. That's how I, how I pulled out of, of it. Well, thank, thanks so much for coming on and telling us your story and all this uh, interesting uh, also kind of historical uh, aspect to this project and how it came to be and everything that came before it. And so thanks for that and, and also for sharing your courageous story because it's, I think, a noble attempt at trying to fix one's own country, especially in the face of uh, such, such, such a challenge because it is, uh, in this case, I think it was quite a big challenge that you undertook. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. It doesn't end here. There's much more to this conversation and you can hear it by signing up for Epicenter Premium. As a premium subscriber, you'll get access to a private RSS feed where you can hear the interview debrief, which goes on for an extra 20 minutes. You'll also get exclusive access to roundtable conversations with Epicenter hosts and bonus content you won't hear anywhere else. Go to epicenter.rocks premium to join the community and support the podcast.